my, like he said, my name is Austin. I'm the Next Gen Pastor and um, excited to preach with you guys today. Uh, before I get into it, just want to really, I guess, just open up and be honest with you guys um, and let you know a little bit about what's been going on in Katie and I's life. Um, because certainly I know, I know so many of you quite well. I, you guys know our, there's so many of you who know, you know exactly what's going on with Katie and I right now. Uh, but the nature of this is like we can't all just know everything about each other, right? And so I just want to inform you a little bit of what's going on because um, ultimately I, th I think some people have the misunderstanding of church and, and preaching as in they think that it's just coming to church and, and hearing a guy unpack what he's learned about that week. And, and all it is is really is a pastor giving a message that they just know more than you about, Right? And so they just try and get up here and like a professor would, they just try and educate a little old uneducated you, right? And that's, that's truly like there's, there's some bits obviously, like I've read commentaries and I've, I've listened to people's thoughts about the, the passage that we're going to be in today. And so there's some of that that is for sure helpful. Uh, but the reality is, is that uh, Kent has taught me this and, and modeled this to me so well that, that you should not be surprised when you're getting ready to preach on something that the Lord suddenly has you living in that message, right? And so I uh, just kind of want to be vulnerable for a moment here, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into it, and you'll kind of see why. And, and ultimately what I hope it does, I hope it gives you the freedom to be honest about where you're at in your story, and so that you can hold that in the proper light with this text as well. So the first thing I would actually really like to do is just uh, all stand together. I know we haven't done this in a little while, but can we stand and read Psalm 23 together? Um, nothing magical that happens here when we stand up, okay? It's just us honoring uh, the word of the Lord that he has given to us. So it's going to be on the screen. Um, I will start us off and just read along with me, and then I'll pray, and we'll sit back down. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Jesus, we just come before this psalm, and there's so much that you have to offer us today. There's so much about you that we can learn and we can glean from it today. So would you, would you, would your Holy Spirit come and do the work of illumination? Would you open up our hearts today so that your word and your truth can penetrate deeply inside of us, God? That is what we need. We don't ultimately need uh, just some clever talk up here today. We need the word of the Lord to get in us. We need to encounter the good shepherd today, God. We love you, and this is all for you. We lay it at your feet, and we ask that you would come and that you would move in the way that you want to move. In Jesus' name, everyone says, amen. amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for standing up with me there. Um, so a few years ago, I was minding my own business just selling insurance, right? That's how, like, every sermon should start, right? So there I was, like, a few years back, selling health insurance, <laughs> and uh, and, and I got this call from Pastor Kent, and he uh, asked to go to coffee with me, and um, I, knew, I knew what the meeting was about. Uh, I had been meeting with friends with Pastor Brian, our former youth pastor. Uh, for several years, we'd been hanging out, and he'd been discipling me, and, and uh, so I, I knew what Kent was going to ask me. He sat me down, he said, hey, Austin, I'd like for you to come and work for me. And at the time, honestly, uh, I, I had my reasons going into the meeting why it probably just wasn't going to work. Like, I knew why it probably just wasn't going to be a good fit. I had a couple hurdles that I just, I, don't, I didn't know if they were clearable to make this happen. And, and like, like it happens when the Lord has clearly worked in something, uh, before I even asked Kent any questions, before I even kind of laid these reasons down, uh, he just started going through some of these things that I had concerns about, some of these things that I didn't know how I was going to get by these things, and he just addressed them one at a time. And so you kind of sit there and you go, oh my goodness, like this is going to work, <laughs> like it's going to happen, you know, and, uh, and it's crazy, uh, but what was crazier is in that coffee, in that meeting uh, a few years back, he said, hey, and I, I'm not promising anything, and I can't tell the future, I'm not, I'm not saying anything when I say this, uh, but I could, you have leadership on you, and I could see you sitting in this seat someday, and I was like, okay, cool, and then I went home, and I told my wife, 
and uh, you know tell her okay yeah he answered this question this is what he said about that yeah he already talked to your dad and like all this kind of stuff and um because I, I worked for katie's dad at the time and so that was like primary hurdle number one and um and then i'm like yeah and then he's like you have this leadership on you and i could see you sitting in this seat someday and she was like wait what and, and i was like wait what like what did i just say did he really say that is that true is that what happened in it like it was and and I have to just be honest with you, it's crazy, because now we get to this time, and a couple months back, Kent announced uh, to everyone that as of the first of the year, he is going to be uh, stepping into a part-time role, and he'll be stepping out of the lead pastor role here at this church. And, um, and he has selected me to replace him, but it doesn't just happen that way. He doesn't just do it. I'm thankful for our constitution and bylaws, the way they're set up, is that you all will vote, uh, the members of this church will vote on if, that, if I'm going to be your lead pastor. And it's incredibly humbling. It's incredibly exciting uh, just to even be in this conversation. And so one thing that you do need to know if you're a voting member here at the church is that uh, the way our constitution and bylaws outlines this process is that I have to make myself available for member interviews, for member, like, times for you guys to ask me questions uh, for a full week, um, and that is going to be this week. And so this week, my contact information, I think we have a slide for it. You can just contact the main office if you'd like. You can call them. You can email them. You can send me an email. Uh, but this is mostly what this is, um, is that a lot of you have similar questions. You want to know, okay, what is, what is this guy's story, right? You want to hear maybe my testimony. You want to hear maybe my heart and my, my dream for the church. And so this is the time to get those questions answered. Uh, the point of the process in this part is that we want you, this is, this is, uh, we hope you're taking this vote seriously. It's a big deal. It's a big decision. And so we want to leave no stones unturned. And so I'm available all week. You can get on my calendar um, if you choose. So understood there? We good there? Yes. Okay, good. Four of you understand. So that's great. I'll talk to you four this week, and it'll be really fun. Um, we'll have a good time. But uh, the, the question that I keep getting throughout this process um, especially now that like kind of words out and, and uh, that vote's happening on the 29th and so it's coming up really quickly like you think Christmas is coming quickly for you like I'm just like wow is the year running out fast um, and so the question has been like man how are you doing through this transition process like how, how's, how are things going how are you feeling and my answer has been unwavering this whole time um, I, I am like I said I'm excited and I'm humbled just even at the thought of this happening is really, it's really uh, deeply honoring to me, my wife. I mean, it's like, it's really exciting to think about. Um, and then at the same time, it's also very terrifying. Like in a very real way, it's, it's scary and it's big. Like this is a big, this is a big shift coming. And uh, you, you couple that, so this whole big potential life-changing thing is happening uh, at the first of the year. And then you, you couple it with, um, you know, a couple, a couple, a few weeks ago, we updated you on the, on the situation with the foster boys that we watched uh, a year ago. They lived with us. We didn't just watch them, but they lived with us. And um, a couple years back, they lived with us for a whole year. And, and we watched Instant Family right at the movies. We watched that, and Katie kind of gave you the little update that all of a sudden, after a couple years of just total darkness with them, not hearing anything, not seeing them at all, uh, they make this kind of surprise resurgence into our life. And even though at the time when we updated you on that Sunday, it didn't look at all like they were going to move in with us, as things do in the foster care world, like they shifted quickly and they moved in with us like the next week, I think. I'm kind of fuzzy on the whole timeline. It's been like a few weeks that they've been in our house. And so, um, yeah, like on the one hand, that has been so fun and so good, like so sweet to reestablish relationship with them and to see them again and to be able to love on them again and to be able to just pray over them and, and, to, and to just ask the Lord to just like heal them. You know what I mean? Uh, and at the same time, it has been very difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, we're like swimming in kids. You know what I mean? Like everywhere you turn in our house, there's a kid or four, you know, like there's six of them total. So it's a lot of, a lot of kids and uh, they've learned some new behaviors. They've learned some new colorful language, you know, like, so this is all just like, we're in it right now. We're in it. And and now here it is. Like I've got member meetings this week. We have this vote coming. I'm preaching these couple weekends and, and man, I think what I'm really just trying to show you guys is not that my life is crazy, pay attention to it, but just that life itself is crazy. Is it not? It's so unpredictable. It's so fickle. 
things are all over the place. Like obviously, like we we are we are like hands in looking looking in on so closely a, a level of, of brokenness and hurting that most of us don't experience on a day to day life. You know what I mean? And then on on the other hand, um, whether or not you feel like life is unpredictable and crazy right now, because I think a lot of us are pretty comfortable, really. And, and life's not that bumpy, life's not that crazy, uh, but we can all be honest about the fact that life is very fragile. So fragile, right? And, and, and in a moment, everything can change. And even just me saying that, I know several of you, I, I know your stories, I know the moment that you go into where everything was different from that moment. And so the promise that we really need to cling to today it is not that just that life is crazy and life is unpredictable, oh, well, see you later. It's that, no, we have a good shepherd. We do. We, we have a shepherd, and we just can walk through this psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David's saying, like, look, I, I've found the Lord. What else could I want? There's a level of contentness that's found in God. There's a level of, of just, like, belonging in your soul once you find him that just puts all of the unpredictableness of life, it just sort of puts it at ease because you go, no, I'm content that I have a shepherd to hold on to. He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Notice those are plural. There's seasons in all of this. Uh, the nature of sheep is that we don't, just go from, we don't just go into one green pasture and you just stay there the rest of your life. Like they have to move. That you, go from, you go from nice green pastures leading beside still waters through valleys. Right, like, and so God's saying, like, there's a, there's a seasonal element. He, he longs to, he wants to refresh and restore your soul. And, and in that, it's going to require some moving around. Right? And, and he leads me in paths of righteousness. So he wants to teach me a way that's good. He wants to teach me a way that's right. Primarily for my sake? No. Not primarily for me, but he wants to primarily do that for his name's sake. The chief end of man is to glorify God. Right? So we're leading, we're led in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The promise in life is not that we won't walk through a valley. It's not that we won't go through hell. It's that he'll be with us. That's the, that's the grand message from scripture, is that above all else, God desires to be with you. And when I'm with him, he has this way, his presence just his very presence in my life has a way of melting my fears. Why is that? Because our God carries a big stick. He has a rod and he has a staff, and they comfort me. It's like when C.S. Lewis says in The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, and he writes, uh, Susan says, oh, I'm a little nervous to meet Aslan the lion, right? Aslan being the picture of God. I'm a little nervous to meet Aslan. Is he safe? And Mr. Beaver says, safe? Of course he isn't safe. He's a lion, but he's good. And he's the king. And so our God, he's not safe. He has all the power. All, he doesn't even have to Thanos snap his fingers. He just opens his mouth and the universe is made. Like he just, he just says it and it, it is. It happens. He has this power that's like that's un, unbelievable. And yet he's kind. And he's good. He's generous. He's loving towards us. And then at this point in the psalm, the, the focus shifts, and he starts to focus on this table. King David starts to focus on this table. And right here we are in Advent, and we said that we're going to be focusing on, we're going to be focusing on this idea of a table and how God uses a very ordinary and regular thing to reveal some of the deep things and profound things about himself through the very relatable experience of a table. And, and so here, before we get into the table, here's what I want to say, is that you've probably heard a sermon on Psalm 23, and it focuses a lot on the sheep. It focuses a lot on the sheep, and, and, and I've heard sermons of, of how the sheep are so dumb, they're so unable to defend themselves, they can't even, like, deal with their own wool, right? They need somebody to tend to them. And there's some helpful analogies in there, are there not? Like, that's helpful at times. But then I've also heard of sermons this week where, you know, people actually focus on how smart the sheep are, how sheep are actually one of the most intelligent animals that they are, and socially they're very, they're very intelligent, very aware. They just need someone to lead them, someone to protect them, someone to guide them. Man, there's helpful stuff that we can draw to that. But, but my point in going through the first, part of the first part of the psalm like this is to show that this psalm isn't primarily about the sheep. It's primarily about the shepherd. So we need to focus on the shepherd first. And before we look at the table that the shepherd is offering to us, 
We need to look at it through the lens of the fact that God, God, the good shepherd, has prepared this table. And so I'm going to focus on three different things. You could say this sermon has three different foci. Have I mentioned how much I really hate that word, though? (laughs) And I will not be using that word. (laughs) I do want you to know I planned on saying that joke, even if he was sitting right there, okay? (laughs) For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, ask somebody. They will tell you of the long, belabored foci joke here at Good Shepherd. I love you, PK, whenever you listen to this. Okay, um... The first thing that we have to know about the table is that it's being set. It's, it's being prepared for us. And that's what's great. Have, have, you ever, have you ever showed up to like small group or shown up to a friend's house and like you just put zero effort into the meal that you were walking into? Like you just got off work. Your day was probably terrible. You and your wife probably fought on the way over to small group, right? Like you're f- fighting in the car. You, no one remembered anything. So you're picking up chips and salsa at the store before you like step in. You didn't shower before you got there. You still smell like work. Like, the day was bad. You skipped lunch. You're starving, right, because of that darn meeting that always goes late. And you never, you didn't even get to eat lunch today. So you're, you're walking to this meal. You're late. You're unprepared. You're starving. You just step in, and your host took notice to every detail of the evening. Like, no Dixie plates on the table tonight. No, it's like the fine china, right? Like, it's nice. It's set. Like, they're all, they're all put together. They look nice. They don't smell like work like you do, right? The, every part of the meal, like, the, the ambiance is set right. They maybe put some candles on. They maybe, they maybe put some music on. So you just walk in and it just feels good. This is the picture of the table. God's taking care of every detail. He's, pre- he's preparing it for us. He's setting it up for us. And it's the this, this sense of stepping into something that's already ready. He's prepared it. It didn't come on your effort. It didn't come on your doing. He is setting this table for us. And there's a couple details in this psalm that show us the nature of our God. It says that uh, he anoints my head with oil. That last line there, you anoint my head with oil. In Hebrew tradition, weary travelers or someone before you would step into a banquet setting, a setting of celebration, uh, the host would anoint your head with a fragrant perfume. And it would, it's, this, it's this sense of refreshment, this sense of like letting you know, like, hey, the party is about to start. This is going to be awesome. Like, hey, I want to make sure you're ready for this. It, I want you to experience and enjoy this in every way that it was meant to be enjoyed. So he anoints our head with oil, and then he says that my cup overflows. It's this picture that God didn't just give you some cup that was like, he didn't give you no half full cup of drink. He, he didn't even stop at the top. He poured it out to overflow. I remember um, my first time ever drinking juice at my in-law's house. And my in-laws right now are like, oh, no, I know exactly what he's going to say. They would like, whenever they'd hand out juice at their house, they'd give you like a quarter of a cup. I don't know if it, like, it was some, something about when they were growing up, they didn't have as much money, and so like the kids got a quarter of a glass. But it was something that never like broke away from them, you know? So every time we still have like Welch's grape juice that costs like $4 for the jug that's like this big, you get like this much juice. I'm like, come on, like, fill that baby up. You know, I came from my house where it was like gallons of milk all the time. I just like dumped the thing, right? This, okay, the spiritual truth in what we're talking about here is this is the picture of God's blessing in your life. That God wants to pour out to overflow in you. He wants to fill you all the way up. But we have to be careful because it's not meant to terminate on us. He fills us up to overflow so that we may pour out into others, but not give out of our own poverty, but give out of our abundance that we've received from him. And so, look, we can't, we can't read Psalm 23 without thinking about John 10. And so if we bounce over to John 10, where Jesus starts to say that, hey, that shepherd, I am the good shepherd. He says, verse 7, uh, no, I'm sorry, verse, verse uh, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I may come so that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so when we get confused and we start talking about God's blessing that he wants to pour out on us, the primary thing, primary thing that God wants to pour out in abundance in your life is life itself. It's not the things of life. What God primarily wants to pour out into you is life and life to an abundance. This is the generosity of our God. 
that he didn't come just to fill you up with things of this life that would go away, that would ultimately be taken away from you, things that you can't take with you onto the next life. Everything in this life is temporary, whether it's money, whether it's health, whether it's your, any, any of the stuff, it's all temporary. It's all going away at some point. But God came that you may have life and have it abundantly, eternally. And that eternal life, that abundant life, he didn't just offer it to you when you die. He offers it to you as soon as you come to know him as your Lord and Savior. He says, I'm going to give you an abundance in life. I'm going to, I'm going to make this more meaningful, more powerful. I'm going, to, I'm going to put a joy in you. I'm going to put something into this life because of who I am as your good shepherd that you will receive an abundance of it from me. That's the promise of our God. This is what it looks like when the table is being set for us is he's preparing this way that we can step in and receive abundant life. And that's the offer that's here for all of us today, is not to work hard and to prepare this table on our own hand to make sure everything's just right for all of our guests and to do all this tedious work, make sure that we're, make sure that we're busily uh, appeasing our God who needs all of these rules and regulations set and adhered to. But he says, no, 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 I'm the good shepherd. I'm preparing the table for you. Come, sit down. And so it's great that the table's being set, but the next thing that is happening is that it's being surrounded. It is surrounded. That's not as fun. The table's surrounded by our enemies. As in, God doesn't just put this table in heaven, and then as soon as you proclaim faith and trust in Jesus, he doesn't just whisk you up there, right? He says, hey, come sit down where there's no more problems, no more, no more hurting, no more enemies around. Just come on up to heaven where everything's good. No, the table is seated here on earth. It's seated here on earth, in which that, that means by default that it has enemies around it. The table is surrounded. And so it, the, the question that we have to ask is surrounded by, by who? Let me just make sure I'm not skipping something. I have this feeling like I'm skipping something. Ah, just the reality of this part of the verse. Like, doesn't this just feel real? Like, I don't know, maybe you were offered some version of Christianity where it was like, hey, just come to know Jesus and everything will be better. Is that, is that the case for you guys? I'm not, I'm not, I haven't been experiencing that as of late. Like, I have kids in my house that I'm just, I'm, I'm asking the Lord, I'm like, God, I need to see the evidence of the good shepherd in their life right now. Because this is tough. And you have stuff in your life where you're like, God, I need to see you as my good shepherd. And so the reality that David shows us in this text is that, hey, it's not just this prim and perfect life that Jesus is offering you. It's one where you very much will still be in the presence of your enemies. But the promise that's in this is that he'll be with us, right? It's, it's not that you won't go through a valley. It's that he'll be with you in the valley. And so by, by that, we need to identify, okay, what are the primary enemies that God's talking about here? I think there's two. I think there's two primary enemies that surround us every day while we're trying to sit at the Lord's table. The first one's sin. first one's sin. And what's awesome is the reality is that when Jesus went to the cross, he crushed the head of the serpent. Right? Yeah, you can, so more, more than one person can amen that, Linda. I think that was you. He crushed the head of the serpent. As in, Genesis, going all the way back to Genesis, we know that, that Adam and Eve, when they gave in to that very first temptation, when they gave themselves over to sin, they chose to, to not listen to God, to not follow the things that he had laid out for them. What happened in that moment is that uh, the human race, everything subsequently, the earth, all of creation was now fractured was now set off of its course. There was a virus that infected every person's genome. I mean, we're at the very core level, we have this sin problem. Every single one of us, every single person in this room, every single person that's outside of this room right now, we have all seen and we've all seen that God is good. We've seen his way. We've been offered it to us, and yet we've chosen our own way. We've chosen rebellion. We've chosen to not listen. We've, we've chosen to do something that's contrary to the heart of God. But when Jesus goes to the cross, this is all that we talked about last week, he doesn't just go to it as a regular guy. He goes to it as someone who lived a perfect life. No sin, no flaws. He, he didn't even have sin in his heart at one point. He didn't even have a sinful thought at one point. Come on, that's like where it's like, oh man, yeah, sinful thoughts too. You got, you got me there. Traffic the other day was brutal and I was like, ah, all over the place, right? Jesus, Jesus was, it, we, it says that he's, he was tempted in every way that we were tempted. And yet he never gave himself over to one of those temptations. 
And so Jesus goes to the cross. He atones. He makes the atoning sacrifice for our sin. He pays the payment for our sin in our place. And then he offers that to us by grace, through faith. He offers us to wear now his righteousness, right? It's everything that we talked about last week. And when we come to faith in Jesus, the lens that God looks at us now is through the sacrifice of Christ. He sees his righteousness as your own, as as your own. God sees you and he sees you as the righteous lamb, the perfect blemish-free lamb. That's how he sees you. And so when we get that, when we understand that, sin no longer carries the guilty verdict it once did. Sin should no longer carry the shame that it once did. Sin does not have the power in my life that it used to have. How many of you in this room right now, you would say, I've come to know Jesus, and there was a sin at one point in my life. It grabbed me. It entangled me. You could even say that it enslaved me, and I was always giving myself over to it, even though I didn't want to. But since coming to meet Jesus, you have found a, a liberation from that sin. Show your hands if that's been you. Have you found freedom from a sin in your life? No, no, come on, raise your hands. Like, let's see them. Look around. This is the promise of our God, that he promises to to liberate us from the bondage of sin. And so the primary enemy that's defeated at the table is sin. That's the first one. And so it's like we're walking up to this table and we realize how imperfect we were, and Jesus is like, no, no, hey, come on, sit down. Come have a seat, right? And Peter says that that sin's kind of like a, it's like a lion, prowling around, just waiting to attack you, right? It's just like crouching there, waiting to get you. So you can picture like walking up to the table and there's like lions all around just waiting to devour you. And Jesus is like, ah, don't worry about them. Come on, let's sit down. No, come on, you're my son, you're my daughter. Have a seat, right? Satan, if you, I, like I swear to me, if you mouth off one more time, I'm going to just, right? There's this attitude. This is like, I mean, this is a, this is a power move on Jesus' end. To say, hey, I know sin's all over the place, but you can just come sit down and eat. Don't even worry about that anymore. I I took care of that on the cross. I, I killed that. We have to be careful, though, because sin, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like got barbs to it. As in it sort of gets in us, and then it wants to hold on, and it wants to get in deeper, and it doesn't want to come out, right? And and James says that sin, once it, when it gets in you, when you give yourself over to sin, the process that happens is, is, is you, you're tempted, you sin, and then, and then it, when, it's, when it's fully grown, it brings forth what? Death. That's the bummer of the process. Right? And you can see the evidence of the deadliness of sin all over the world. All over, even in your own, in your own heart, in your own life. Like God's ways, obedience to Christ, will just lead to like better things. <laughs> There's no prosperity gospel here. It's just, it's just true. Like, if you follow God's rules, it will generally work out better for you. Right? But you can see how there's the destructiveness of sin all over the world. And, and that's the really bad news, is that when sin, when it's fully mature, when it's fully grown, it brings forth death. But the good news is that the second enemy that God sits you down in front of is death itself. It's death itself. Look at how King David ends up the psalm. Let's put that last slide up here. He says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Just a great promise again that God's going to be with you. His goodness, his mercy, they're always going to be available to you. And then this last sign, or this last line that King David, the man after God's own heart, writes in this psalm is, Surely I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He puts, this, he puts this permanence to the table here. Where he says, hey, it's not just going to be a matter of like you're surrounded for your enemies forever, but you will dwell in his house for the rest of time. That's a long time. Like forever and ever and ever and ever and ever goes on for a really long time. And, and when we can fix our eyes on eternity, when we can focus our mind and our heart that there's a permanence to all of this, it makes the everyday troubles, it makes the everyday problems look small. Does it not? I'm not, I'm not saying forget about this life and just focus on eternity because that's not the call at all. I, am I praying that these boys would experience healing in my house right now? Am I, am I begging the Lord that they, would, that they would find the right home to go into, that they would get into that home, that they, that they would be safe, that they would heal, that their trauma would be, like, be mended and put back together? Of course. Of course I'm asking for that. Do I, have, do I have friends that are sick that I'm contending, asking the Lord to heal them? Absolutely. I, like, I, I so wish Tim didn't even go into surgery on Friday. We were begging the Lord that he wouldn't have to. 
But you know what I really want? At the end of the day, I want those boys in my house to experience forever with their father. That's what I really want. I, I, what I want for Tim is I, I don't want just a surgery to make things better for now. I, I want his body made fully new. I want him to live that renew, in that renewed body for eternity. That, like, when you start looking at it that way, you, you almost start to pray differently. You start to oh, go, okay, God, listen, you're God. You do what you want to do, and I'm going to ask that you heal, and then I'm going to hold it with an open hand because at the end of the day, there is no end of the day. I have forever to experience sitting at your table and while the table is surrounded now, it will not be forever. It will only be surrounded in this short and momentary time. But then eventually we're going we're gonna to go and we're going to belong in a place where sad things become untrue, where hurts are redeemed and, and, and they are forgotten. We're going to go to a place where there is no more sickness, there is no more disease, there is no brokenness. And we're going to dwell in the house of our Lord for forever. And, and so... The table, the table's been set for us. God's prepared it himself. The table is surrounded. For right now, it's surrounded. But then once we understand that God has bought me this table, he's paid for me to have a seat at this table for forever, we can start to describe the table as the safest place that, it will ever, that we could ever be. Because our salvation, and, and, our, and our, it's, it's secure, it's safe in him and what he's done for us. There's this permanence to it. It's not going anywhere. It's available to everyone today. And so, I, again, I don't know what it is that you're going through. I, I, don't, I, don't, I couldn't possibly know everyone's story. And maybe you're going through it right now. Maybe, like, maybe you're in the middle of the valley right now, and you just needed to know today that, that you have a protector that's with you, that you do have a provider, and he's going to be there with you. M maybe today, I, I mean, some of you, gosh, you're probably experiencing some of the sweetest moments that life can offer. And, and that's awesome. You, like, enjoy that green pasture. Worship God in that green pasture. Don't forget him. Don't get so obsessed with the green grass. Be so focused on the one who gave it to you. Be focused on the shepherd that led you there. Man, but no matter where we're at today, like we all have to acknowledge, we all have to be ready to admit that life can change in a moment. It's unpredictable. It, it, it's crazy. I mean, you can eat all the vegetables. You can diffuse all the essential oils. You can exercise all you want to. You can get a diagnosis in a day that will change your life. And so my hope for all of you today is that you've already made the decision to cling to the Good Shepherd, that you're not waiting to cling to him in a moment when you really need him. You need to cling to him right now. You need to make the decision right now, walking out of this church today, that no, my God has prepared a table for me, and I'm going to cling to him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to depend on him. I'm going to be led by him starting now. I'm not going to wait for the valley. I'm not going to wait for the abundance. I'm going to start right now. I'm going to cling to him, and we're going to walk step in step no matter what we're going through. Pray with me. Jesus, we just invite you to lead us and to guide us. God, would you just be present in each person's life, especially in this Christmas season when life can be difficult, life can be painful, there can be memories, God, that are brought up, there can be heartaches that are that are just right so at the surface, God, so in the forefront of our minds. Would you just be near those people? Would you be the comforter to those people? Would you show us all that sin and death, they don't need to be the enemies. They don't need to give them attention like we used to. Would you just remind us this morning, speak to our souls this morning that you have, you have paid for it. It's done. It's finished. God, help those of us who are living in abundance right now, those of us who are just experiencing your goodness and your mercy, and it's just so readily available. Help us not to neglect the gift giver today. Help us to just remember that, that you are the shepherd that has led us to this spot in life. Jesus, we trust you. We want you to continually lead us, guide us, protect us, cultivate a righteousness in our heart for your name's sake, God. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.